Okay, are we ready now? It says live stream now. Are we set? Uh, give it two seconds. All right, you should be good now. Good, thank you. Uh, good evening and happy new year. I'd like to call this meeting of the Land Use and Building Management Committee of the Common Council to order on Wednesday, January 4th, 2023 at 7.02 p.m. Uh, with us tonight, we have uh, Mr. Hooverman, uh, Ms. Smith, Mr. Burnett, uh, Mr. Meek, and Ms. Alterman. So we do have a quorum. First item, uh, next item of business is public participation. Do we have anybody signed up to speak? Mike? Mike, anyone? That's you. Uh, there, there, there is one attendee in the waiting room, Brennan White. Um, that's, that's part of the design team. Yeah, okay, so, but, oh. but nobody for public participation then? Nope, that was okay. the only person. Okay. That I will close public participation and move to approval of the minutes of the meeting of December 7th, 2022. Do I have a motion? So um, move. Man, thank you. Uh, are there any uh, corrections, addition, changes to the minutes? Seeing none, I'll call for vote. All in favor? Indicate by raising hand. Uh, Mr. Meek, uh, opposed? I, I'm an abstaining. Okay. Uh, Ms. All, uh, in favor, except Mr. Meek, who abstains. Okay, thank you. Moving on to new business. First item is to review the request to provide project contingency for additional scope with Energy Resources USA for lighting retrofit project. We refer the following to the Common Council for action. I'm going to read both items. Uh, A1 and 2, authorize Office of Building Management to execute change order on contract with Energy Resources USA to provide LED lighting retrofit services at the Norwalk Public Works Center for a total not to exceed, exceed $3,907.41, account noted. And 2, authorize the Office of Building Management to execute change order on contract with Energy Resources USA to provide LED lighting mm -hmm. retrofit services at the Norwalk Fire Headquarters for a total not to exceed Four thousand six hundred fifty-eight dollars and three cents. Account noted. Do you have a motion, please, Mr. Burnett? Thank you, Alan. Yeah, it's a pretty straightforward item. Uh, this is previously approved by the Common Council. We never approve any contingency. So once we sign the contract, we have the uh, cons uh, the project team, basically a turnkey operation. They come and look at our existing. Uh, we gave them some preliminary, uh, preliminary information about the building and stuff, and they gave us a proposal. So after we sign the contract, they go and look at it. It turned out that we had additional lights that we didn't encounter, well, we didn't count it in, as well as um, I, I believe it was the uh, fire headquarters. There's some of the light fixture has an emergency power backup into it. So we need to provide that as part of new fixtures. So there's some changes. Again, we never approve any contingency. So so that's why we have to come back. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. It's, a, it's 3, 000, uh, two item, each one is the three, $4,000. Okay, thank you. Any questions for discussion? Seeing none, I'll call for vote. All in favor? Three, three, four, five. Uh, Mr. Meek, are you in? Okay, it's unanimous. Thank you. Okay, moving item B, review request to increase design contingency with Salomon <laughs> Associates for underground oil tank removal project and refer the following to the Common Council for action. Authorized to increase the continuing contingency allowance for Salomon Associates PC for underground oil tank removal project in various school locations to provide additional environmental design services and environmental testing monitoring services for contaminating materials for an additional amount of $55,000. Account noted. Give a motion. Ms. Smith, thank you. Uh, Alan? Oh, no, Spill, this is you. Yes, this is me. Uh, good evening, all, and uh, thank you. So uh, I know I've talked about this project uh, quite some time. Uh, just a quick review. We had eight underground oil storage tanks removed over the summer. And the initial plan was to have a series of them uh, removed and replaced with above ground oil storage tanks. And we had an agreement with Salomon Associates to do so. While they were planning that and spent time and money uh, we were able to work with Eversource to find three of the sites to receive natural gas. 
So it was a reshift in design to address those areas. The money and time was spent for above ground tanks and they had to spend time to design for gas igniters instead. In addition to that, um, out of all of the eight tanks, we did in fact find some contaminated soils in one location. Now I may have reported to you in the past where none of the sites had contaminated soils. When test results came back at Naramac and Naramac only, uh, they found that there was some spillage back in 1989 when the tank that we just removed was being installed. That was never addressed back then, so we are addressing it now. Thus, Salomon needs to add some more costs to their design and planning for the remediation aspect at Naramac. So uh, what we are looking for is $55,000 increase, and we have the funds available in that existing account. So Bill, that, that's the cleanup money? Is that what it is for? Yes. So let me ask you this, for the overall project, you know, when we first went at it, as you noted, we were going to uh, replace all the tanks, right? We gonna, Well, I think it was all, maybe all of them or most of them with above ground tanks. We don't have to do that for some of them now. So does that mean overall the project's less money? Uh, yes, overall the project was less money in that sense. But now that we have contaminated soils, it's gonna raise it, but um, we still have the funding within the account. It just wasn't anticipated. Any idea how much excess there is? Uh, I don't have that figures with me. Okay, no. all right, thank you. Uh, any questions? Okay, I'll call for vote. All in favor? One, two, three. Okay, it's unanimous. Thank you. All right, moving on. Review bid recommendation for Silver Mine School parking and bus parent drop off improvements and refer item two to the Common Council for action. It's okay. One is the approved recommendation to begin the special capital appropriation process for Silver Mine Elementary School parking and parent bus drop off improvements in the amount of $425,000. Alan, wait, before I go on, so we're going to approve tonight. We're being. Uh, yeah, let me, sorry, Tom, let me interrupt you. Um, <clears throat> there's two items on the agenda. Uh, the reason being the first item, you don't have to, you have to approve it. You don't have to approve it, but it's a, it's really for your information, the land use committee's information purposes, uh, so that you understand the project come, came, you know, the bids came in, and um, because the special appropriation project does not require the land use and building management committee to act on it. So really just a referral to you that by the way, this project went out to bid, and for your understanding of where we are, and then your recommendation that uh, it's uh, to proceed with a special appropriation process. It's not a requirement of the ch city charter, it's just uh, information for, for the committee so that you, you recognize that there's a need for additional money. Uh, okay, so so we should approve of one and two A today. Right, you approve one and two. Okay, so let's do a, a, two A, authorize the Mayor Harry W. Rilling to execute an agreement with B&W Paving and Landscaping LLC for the Silvermine Elementary School driveway improvement projects for a total not to exceed $1,744,000 pending approval of special capital appropriation. Account noted and B authorized the MPS facilities department to issue change orders on this contract for a total not to exceed $174,500 pending approval of a special capital appropriation account noted. Do I have a motion, please? Anyone? Anyone? Uh, thank you, Ms. Hatter Alderman. Um, okay, uh, Bill, is this you? Yes. So um, this project goes back uh, a, a little ways. And $1.5 million was approved by Common Council back in, I think it was 2020. And with, there was a few delays in design. There were a few delays uh, COVID related, um, um, but, but the much needed project was, we're hoping to do it this coming summer. So we put it out to bid and the funding of 1.5 million, which was a couple of years ago, we received two bids back. The lowest uh, was a uh, 1.744. So we're trying to make up that shortfall. We know how important this project is. So uh, it was recommended for a special appropriation. What we did do is we took a look at the NPS capital account, the overall accounts that they have allocated. And we were able to find this money 
within the NPS capital budget. Approximately half of this ask uh, is in paving. So we plan to make a request to shift that over in addition to some other funding to make up for the shortfall because um, this project has gained a lot of momentum with the mayor, the superintendent and the entire Silver Mine community. We feel that um, we have the time, um, we can allocate the money within the capital budget and we'd like to move forward with the capital appropriation process. So Bill, where, where is the money coming from? Because I, I know, I had asked you before about the status of the, say, the Brian McMahon High School parking lot. Is that something that is still going to be in the in process, or where's well, the money? Well, the Brian McMahon parking lot, um, that is a request we're making in the um, upcoming budget process. Okay. okay so is in, in hopes to do that this coming summer. That money has not been uh, appropriated just yet. Gotcha. So this is not coming from that. It's coming from other places. No. Okay. Uh, Mr. Burnett. Uh, yes, thank you, Ch uh, Chairman Livingston. Um, I I'm on that same thought. Um, uh, uh, Mr. Hodell, could you share with us when you say you found $425,000 from other accounts, where did you find it from? So the uh, capital monies that have been appropriated to the Board of Ed over the years, um, in some cases, uh, there is money that wasn't used in full. For, an exa for example, about half of this ask is with the paving. We have about $200,000 in paving that um, is still sitting there. We could still use it for a school, but instead we want to appropriate that to this project. In addition to that, we have some other funding um, that was within the capital uh, projects uh, program that in fact, when we shared this with uh, Henry Dakowitz, he was happy that we were able to relocate within the existing funding as opposed to going outside. So where do we find this money? Again, within the capital appropriation over a number of years that's sitting there. Uh, if I could just have a follow-up to that, uh, you know, I'm $425,000 is nothing, is not a small amount of money. Um, uh, it, it just poses the question as to how much more is sitting out there not used, but at some point allocated to be used. Do, do we have a handle on what that total amount is? I believe what is available is about 475000 of which we are asking for 425 of that. Okay, uh, just the follow com final comment is it would be at least helpful for me to see the detail as to what projects this these dollars are coming from. If that can be provided, that would be appreciated. Yeah. Yes, um, and I believe that would me, be... I'm sorry, let me interrupt. I think um, um, that information will be available when we go for a special appropriation process, when we go in BET and, uh, and planning and zoning, and then we go to finance committee. So the recommendation coming from the finance department will include that, that the information that Bill is providing the committee on and the detail that will be available to the finance committee. Again, uh, land use really, it's, uh, it's uh, the project's coming to us and we want a general idea. Uh, Greg, remember the time that recently when the fire department requested a, pro a special appropriation went to the finance department and you were asking like, how come, what, what happened? What, what, what? So I think this, is, this would be the normal process that they would have come to here. Did we talk about it? You know, the project's over budget and if we need additional money. And then generally speaking, the committee was support, whether we support it or not support it. And then we start the special appropriation process. So the financial aspect of this request will be coming to you under the uh, as part of special appropriation. And the detail that I was indicating will be part of that discussion. Yes. Great. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Smith. Um, yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm just curious what the delay was. Um, the, you know, these funds were approved uh, more than a couple of years ago, and this is a very important project. Um, you know, there's significant safety issues at that school. What was the what was the delay in getting this started? Um, there was definitely a, in the beginning there was a COVID delay. Um, the state health department had to come down because they had to do a personal inspection 
the fact that there's a um, septic system uh, on the site and there's and that involved drainage, uh, DEP and traffic had to uh, spend extra time in uh, allocating um, their time to review the plans, which was um, finally submitted to me last summer. So um, while we had hoped that be completed by now, you know, those delays, we had no other choice. Okay, and, and, and I understand that. Um, you commented earlier that you hope to get this project started um, this summer. Do you anticipate there could be a further delays? No, no further delays other than the uh, additional approval process that's required for the special appropriation. Understood. Okay, thanks, Bill. Let, let me, I'm sorry. Um, I know this is not my project. I just wanted to give, provide some uh, input. Um, <clears throat> um, as we go, uh, uh, the second item, uh, second portion of this item is about approving the uh, contractor. So what we were asking for is that the committee understand where we are with this project, the need for special appropriation. At the same time, we're requesting committee approval subject to the special appropriation. So that after this meeting, we will start the uh, special appropriation process. By the time we go to finance committee, assume the finance committee recommends it. When you go to common council, I will put the, site, the same item on as approving the contractor so that we doesn't have to come back again. So that's to save time. Uh, one of the reasons that by the time we approve approval of special appropriation in February, uh, we still execute a contract. And thereafter, we got all the two, two things that would take time consuming. One is site lighting. We probably take between 12 to 14 weeks to 16 weeks for delivery. And then the other, the, uh, the, uh, the storm, storm, storm water retention system probably takes be about six to eight weeks for delivery. So I think uh, the way we work the schedule out is probably by the time we, we are, the school ends, uh, the, the retention system, the, 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 the domes that required would be available for construction. Uh, and then the light lighting should be coming in the summer. If not, it would be September. So we're cutting close as we stand now because delivering time. So, Alan, are you going to pose that this item as written be on the council agenda next Tuesday, or, or are we going to wait till? No, after it will not be next week. It will be. Okay, when, we're going to wait till after we get the right okay. at the same at the same agenda. So you see both. You see the special appropriation and approval of the contract at the same time. Gotcha, um, Mr. Meek. Um, thanks. The the spec here only indicates that it's the driveway loop. Or are, are, are we going to do the the parking lot too, the parking lot that's um, north of there for faculty or? Yes. So uh, you're going to, um, the way you enter the site right now will be widened and the front of the building will have um, some parking up against Perry Avenue. But most importantly, there'll be a bus lane that um, doesn't really exist right now. It's kind of mixed with uh, parent cars. Uh, while down below that entire parking lot will be um, torn up and replaced and the deten retention system that um, Adam mentioned will be installed under that. So yes, um, everything, yeah, yeah. every bit of asphalt uh, that you see there will be replaced as well as curving. Okay, excellent. That's, um, that's what I wanna know. And then in, in this regard, does this put to bed any of those old pipe dreams that somebody was going to build a new school building there on top of the old lot on the north side? I'm sorry, I don't have that history, but uh, I can tell uh, you this that was, was a... kicked around for a while. I, I never saw the feasibility of it, but um, you know, I don't we're, that's there's nothing else going on there where we're putting in a parking lot and then going to scrap it in a few years. Oh, not to my knowledge. Uh, the only okay. Other item, as I mentioned, under the soccer field is the leaching field for the septic system. And um, you yeah. know, it just becomes a factor because it's in close proximity. Well, you got the, you got the river behind and it, too. River. So, yes. Uh, I'm all set. Thanks. Okay. Uh, any further discussion? Uh, seeing none, I'll call for a vote. All in favor? One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. Pass unanimously. Thank you. All right. Um, next item has to do with furniture, fixture, and equipment. Oh, no, do we to, I'm sorry, Tom. Do we have to go to item B? We, we, we didn't... No, I read them both. I read them all. Oh, you read both? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, very good. Yeah. That's right, you did. I'm sorry. My fault. Okay. Um, furniture, fixture, and equipment for Cranberry. I'm really going to read all this. 
Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's just go to it. I'm going to move all these items together. Um, 1A, off, just might as well sit down. Authorize the purchase, purchasing agent to issue a purchase order to in Salco Corporation for various furniture items for the Cranberry Elementary School new project for a total sum of $168,147.57 account noted. B, authorize the purchasing agent to issue change orders and purchase order for a total not to exceed $8,400. 2A, authorize the purchasing agent to issue a purchase order to Lakeshore Learning Materials LLC for various furniture items for the Cranberry Elementary School new project for a total sum of $51,389.61. Account noted. B, authorize the purchasing agent to issue change orders on purchase order for a total not to exceed $5,000. 3A, authorize the purchasing agent to issue a purchase order to Robert H. Lord Co. for the various furniture items from the Cranberry Elementary School new project for a total sum of $772. But account noted, B, authorize the purchasing agent to issue change orders and purchase order for a total not to exceed $500. 4A, authorize the purchasing agent to issue a purchase order to Red Thread Spaces LLC for various furniture items for the Cranberry Elementary School new project for a total sum of $218,884. Account noted. B, authorize the purchasing agent to issue change orders on purchase order for a total not to exceed $11,000. 5A, authorize the purchasing agent to issue purchasing, a purchase order to WB Mason Co. Inc. for various furniture items from the Cranberry Elementary School new project for a total sum of three. $346,141, count noted. B, authorize the purchasing agent to issue change orders on purchase order for a total not to exceed $40,000. 6A, authorize the purchasing agent to issue a purchase order to CT Communications State Contract, noted for the telephone system for the Cranberry Elementary School new project for a total sum of $28,694. Count noted, B, authorize the purchasing agent to issue change orders on purchase order for a total not to exceed $2,000. 7A, authorize the purchasing agent to issue a purchase order to Raptor Technologies LLC for the visitor management system for the Cranberry Elementary School new project for a total sum of $1,923.50, count noted. Uh, B, authorize the purchasing agent to issue change orders and purchase order for a total not to exceed $500. A, A, authorize the purchasing agent to issue a purchase order to total communications state contract noted for com computer networking electronics for the Cranberry Elementary School new project for a total sum of $162,877.38 account noted. B, authorize the purchasing agent to issue change orders and purchase order for a total not to exceed $10,000. 9A, authorize the purchasing agent to issue a purchase order to Environmental Systems Corporation, state contract noted for digital displays for the Cranberry Elementary School new project for a total sum of $7,311.70. Count noted, B, authorize the purchasing agent to issue change orders on purchase order for a total not to exceed $1,000. 10A, authorize the purchasing agent to issue a purchase order to Environmental Systems Corporation for computer charging stations for the Cranberry Elementary School new project for a total sum of $15,328. Count noted, B, authorize the purchasing agent to issue change orders on purchase order for a total not to exceed $1,000. Do I have a motion? Uh, Ms. Alterman, thank you. Okay. Who's going to talk about furniture fixtures and equipment? Um, Mike is uh, just before he starts. Um, that's why they do it over. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, Mike, uh, Mike, uh, my friends is going to talk about it. But uh, just before, just, um, typically for items that are less than twenty-five thousand dollars, does not require common council action. Uh, the reason we put all of these together so that it's a comprehensive all the furniture that we're buying that you see all of them. But Tom, if you uh, if the committee chooses, I can just take the item off so you don't have to read that much of it in, uh, during the council. Oh, now, now you do this, Alan? <laughs> <laughs> but it's nice to see all of it together, so you know. No, this I, is... I, I actually I agree with you. I like the committee <laughs> to see it all. Um, I think it's a better practice. Right, uh, it's way more comprehensive. But if you don't feel like, I mean, if you don't, whoever's going to read that to next week, uh, I, mean, I don't think. <laughs> Yeah, um, I don't know how the committee feels. Um, I like the idea of everybody knowing what's out there and what we're doing as a whole. Um, okay, it's not that's that much fine. more to read. Let him read Thank it. Thank you. Yep. Mike, please. Yep. So uh, the furniture and technology package is pretty standard for um, basically all the schools that we've completed to date. Um, once the construction of the Cranberry new Cranberry Elementary School is completed. It'll be completely outfitted with new furniture, network electronics, 
new phones, uh, new digital displays. Um, you know, throughout this process, we've met with quite a few folks from the school, including the administration, uh, staff members, uh, the IT department for the Board of Education, uh, the security department for the uh, Board of Education to ensure that everything that we would be purchasing is in line with what what they'll be with how they'll be using the uh, equipment. So, you know, we went as far as to bring in color samples and, you know, cut sheets for every piece of furniture that was being implemented into the program, into the new school to ensure that what, what we were going to be purchasing would be, uh, would fit their needs and work adequately for the teaching program at the school. Um, that was over the course of a couple months. The plans were then brought to the state of Connecticut for approval and allowed to go out to bid. Um, we first put this project out to bid in November publicly. Um, we then rebid it because we weren't uh, satisfied with the amount of response that we received on the first bid. And uh, when we bid it the second time, we, we did get quite a few more quotes on the furniture. Um, all of the uh, state contract items were solicited to multiple vendors. And for almost all of them, we received two quotes for comparison. Um, you know, in some cases, uh, we, we only did receive one that was on the digital displays and the uh, charging stations. But, um, you know, uh, recommendations have been made by the full design team uh, to the city through me. And as a result, the package that's in front of you is the result of all, all of the recommendations and the bid analysis that was completed. So how does the total compare to what we budgeted? Uh, it's approximately $200,000 less than what we budgeted. Oh, good answer. <laughs> uh, any any questions? Any discussion? Uh, Mr. Meek. Um, yeah, I mean, our, my question kind of goes back to history I might have missed, but didn't, didn't you do all this similar work for Jefferson and then they decided to Y'all decided to use the same old crappy furniture. Is it, is there any risk for this and that? Uh, at, at, at Jefferson, we actually replaced the majority of the furniture in the building. Maybe I have that wrong. I thought there was one of the projects where we ended up scrapping some of the furniture requests. It, it's, it probably was Ponus a few years ago. Okay, so uh, yeah, is there any risk here for, for that, yeah. or you guys all feel good about this? Everyone's lined up. Uh, I feel very confident the stuff that we're proposing to you will 100% get used. The principal's yeah. been very, <laughs> I think, very, I think the, very, I think very the engaged. Uh, situation that Alan was referencing was uh, the furniture company provided the wrong type of chair. And so they uh, replaced the uh, uh, the incorrect chairs with new chairs, but didn't want the ones that they uh, provided incorrectly back. So there were some additional chairs. So Jefferson or? Ponus. It was Ponus, yeah. And Ponus, there's a long discussion about we, we provide preparation for a lower school that was new. The assistant school, we decided we were trying to debate what, what furniture needed. And what what we weren't going to replace, so there was little, there was discussion about uh, additional furniture we placed on the existing school. Correct. Um, okay, so last question. First, let me preface it. I, I'm all for the new furniture and everything else, but just doing a little due diligence going down your schedule. The only thing I could kind of glean on it: um, ninety dollars per flag per room. Are, does that include installation or I'm just trying to reconcile that with the $30 flags I buy over at Home Depot for my house? Um, I'll have to take a look at that. Um, I mean, it would, you it know, would, it would know include... maybe it's something WB Mason doesn't specialize in or something. I just, I, I couldn't pick heads or tails out of any other thing on here. I don't know if the price is right. That, that was just again just doing due diligence i want all this stuff it just seems like a lot of money for a flag and questions puts into question is is everything else like a good price too on that list what 
Which line item is that, Brian? Uh, under WB Mason, but if you go into the packet and you kind of turn your head sideways on the two schedules, you can see you can see towards the bottom of sorry, I should have had it marked up. Okay, I see it now. Ninety dollars per see flag. Thirty three flags at ninety bucks a piece. So yeah. I'm hoping that that includes the hardware and the installation, but I, yes. I don't know. Yes, it would. Um, okay. It would. And, you know, occasionally sometimes what happens with these packages is that, you know, WB Mason is supplying quite a bit of furniture for the package. So in order to remain competitive with some of the other items, they may have dropped the cost of some of the other items and reallocated some of the cost towards the flags. Okay, but I mean they're going to screw that, the hardware into the wall, yes, and put the flag yes, in. And, yes. Okay, that that's fine. And that's you answered my and question that, perfectly. And again, whether or not they allocated some of the cost from some of the other items, you know, would be purely speculation. Um, but WB Mason uh, did did actually supply the flags for the Jefferson School, and they were all installed. Excellent. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Mr. Burnett? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, uh, my question is basically, is there any FF&E currently being used in the current Cranberry School that will be utilized in the new Cranberry School? And if not, is there an opportunity to um, maybe redistribute the FF&E that's currently in the Cranberry School to other existing schools? I'm sure... It's equipment that's not in bad shape. Um, it's functional. Um, I, I, you know, what are we going to do with it? Are we going to just scrap it, or what happens to that so, equipment? Um, so, you know, we did we did do an analysis of the furniture that was in was in the existing Cranberry School when we were preparing the new uh, package, and uh, you know, while some of it still may have some useful life, um, given the equipment that we will be providing for the new Cranberry School, uh, the package was moved forward. We are working with the Board of Education as far as redistributing any furniture that may be utilized in other buildings. Um, we've, we've already started that process. And uh, anything that's deemed to not be useful in, an, in another location will be disposed of after, after, a dis, after the disposition process is completed. This, this, when we say disposed of, do we mean actually thrown away and not offered to nonprofits or other well, organizations? That, let me let me let me let me let me that, respond to uh, uh, Greg. The the process actually is not handled by Mike or I or Jim. It's actually a board of education's process. So the first thing mm -hmm. the board need to do is go through the school and then find anything that they think is valuable and they need to. Uh, they need to go around the school system to figure who may want so, those pieces of furniture or equipment. After that, they have to look at what's remaining to find, assess the value. Everything has a little bit of value, right? But at some point is that who's buying secondhand or thirdhand uh, uh, school furniture? Uh, it's very seldom there's a, there's a market for, for, for the secondhand furniture, whether some of them could be 30 years old, 40 years old, some could be 10 years old, some could be five years old. So somehow people look at it it's not a simple thing. At some point, the boy decided that, you know what, there's no interest on certain things or, or, or resale value. Then they can offer it to, to nonprofit in the community. The problem we have, uh, I'm not saying we're not, they're not going to do that, but the problem we have is that as soon as, let me jump around a little bit. I'm, required, I'm requesting the construction manager, which is Newfield Construction, to advise us by middle to end of April to confirm that we will finish this new school by the end of summer. With that understanding by April, then we know that we are going to start, ten, we, as soon as school's, school is over in the springtime, we are going to, within a week after all the kids leave, we are going to start doing abatement in the, in the existing building. So the problem we have is that for any nonprofit that wants anything from that building, they have about one week to take it away of what they think they need. So it's a, it's a narrow time frame. So it's not a simple thing to do. 
in terms of uh, coordinating the stuff. So I I'm not saying we're not doing it. I think that we will offer it. I think the budget will offer it, but it's just coordinating it and get it done within a week's time. It's very challenging. So I just want you to prepare about that because there are a lot of stuff is going to throw away. Um, I don't know where, because we get, we, we keep stuff in, uh, in uh, what you call it, in, uh, in a bricks, school, bricks High School. And the stuff, a lot of stuff is still there. It's going to be there for the next 10, 15 years. So at some point, it's not worth paying money to move some of the stuff once and store it for 15 years and then throw it away again and high move it and move it and then put it in a dumpster at that point. So we need to be sensitive about what we say, what the value is, and and and, and be very um, professional in terms of evaluating the, the real value to the taxpayer in our work. I mean, this is, this is something that's 15 years old. If nobody wants it now, we're not going to try to store it because now 10 years from now, it's 25 years old in, in debt storage and we would pay money to movers to move it twice, you know? So we really value all that. We'll help mm -hmm. all of that to look at this stuff, but ultimately it's a board of best process. That's it. Uh, Ms. Alterman. Thank you. Um, and sorry, if I stop talking, I'm having weird coughing fits. Um, I just had a, well, I had two questions and one comment. One was um, the furniture at the school is pretty dated. I used to you know, be there frequently to volunteer it's completely functional and safe, but it's pretty dated. So any, I think any concern that it's like wasting or not repurposing um, is probably just not true of that specific school, but you know, that's not my specialty. Um, I had a question, the, like the building seems like it's going up so quickly. Is that normal? What are you having to do to get them to be so expeditious? And like, does that yeah. reduce cost or everything's the same? I, I am like really impressed with it. Well, it's it really come down is because of Greg Burnett. At my 40th and uh, working <laughs> anniversary, he made a comment about on time on, on, on budget. <laughs> so it's a challenge. But no, I mean, seriously, um, it is very, um, it is, it is very efficient in terms of managing these projects, in terms of like all the trades. I mean, we hear all this horror story about contracting low bidders and doing construction work. That's still all true. It's really a, a, a relationship and chemistry thing, which part they are project that you know potential are problems, right? So, but at the same time, with this project and uh, you know uh, Newfield has done, um, you know, finish uh, finish uh, Polnus and went to uh, no, yeah, they did Polnus, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they did, Pol they did Polnus in Jefferson. Uh, but at the same time, it's not the same con trade contractor. We go out to bid for a trade contractor, but because of those relationships, I think sometimes the trade contractor are more interested in doing project with a certain uh, general contract, um, uh, construction manager because there is a good relationship, understanding how things work and doesn't work together. So I'm I'm pleased too because uh, you know we give it about what, 14 months or 16 months for construction. At this point, we're still meeting those dates. There's a couple items that we're concerned about, but we're tracking very, very closely. One is the transformer that's coming from Eversource. They, uh, they, we ordered a long time ago, but the uh, the delivery day is March 14, I think something like that. So uh, it, is a, it is a sensitive item that we need to track on. But that's why I gave a, a new field construction <coughs> request that by middle to later April, um, that they need to confirm with us that we are ready to move by end of semester. If not, then we can start dem demolishing the existing building. So, so there's a game plan behind this in terms of like, you know, what and when we, what we can and cannot do. So, I mean, if something really drastic happened in the next few months and the potential we can't move in in September, then the existing building will, will still be open. But at the same time, we know by mid to, middle to end of April. You're muted. How do you mute it? Sorry. <laughs> um, the last question was, I'm, I think it was Mr. Meek or maybe it was Mr. Burnett who said like, are they repurposing anything from inside the building? Um, at least a year ago when I was in some of the meetings um, with, with everyone here, we had definitely spoken about the school would be really interested in doing that. Is that still a plan to be able to have some elements like incorporated to pay homage or whatever to the old school? I, th I think that the school community should work with the principal and, get, and and so the principal can get to us in terms of certain things that you guys want to keep for uh, um, um, for, for momentum stuff. Um, but um, yeah, generally speaking, I, I ran into this, this, I mean, I, 
I know sometimes like I, I know when we moved the police station, fire station, we got brand new furniture and people bringing old chairs that's like 25 years old, you know. <laughs> so those oh, are no. yeah. I thought so they had spoken about making like mosaics out of oh, okay. like making art out of it, but maybe that's not I'll, I can speak to the principal. Maybe yeah, I can yeah, yeah. And for, yeah. If you can go for go for her and then uh Jenna will, will get to us a certain thing that, that if you want to display or something, by all means, you know. Uh, okay. That's part of the history of the school and things like that. Yeah. Uh, but, but we were very cautious about because I tr we tried to be very specific and straight about you know teachers and, and police department, fire department don't bring stuff when, when you go through the expense of buying new furniture. Uh, we want everything to be consistent and, and no sense of bringing old stuff you know with duct tape. I'm, I'm, it's not mm -hmm. exaggerating; it happened. <laughs> yeah. Old chair with duct tape, they still want to bring it over because for the years they've been like the police department. For the years they've been in those buildings, they've been collecting stuff all along, and that's to them that's valuable stuff, you know. So anyway. Okay. Brian? Um, yeah, since it was brought up after I spoke, I, I just did want to attest that there is almost nothing in that building worth salvaging. Um, maybe except for the boiler, but that's a much bigger thing. But in terms of FF and E, I think maybe just the, um, like we have the, the portable um, cafeteria tables might be used somewhere else, or those were pretty new. And then I think we bought a couple new chairs and desks for the library but that that's just small and then just anecdotally every i've had kids in their last 12 years and every year they ask us to bring in tennis balls for the old crappy chairs and desks so they don't dig holes into the floors i mean that that stuff is all that stuff is all spent that's that's trash it's not even not even salvageable or donatable in my opinion anyway just my two cents on that yeah, when you mentioned the boiler, there's a conversation between uh, uh, Bill's office, uh, George. Uh, we are we are salvaging the uh, burners, uh, the boiler. We we won't be dismantling it uh, for for reuse. The burner we can simply remove and potentially use for other places. Uh, um, yeah. Yeah, it was like a million bucks we spent on that. I remember. I don't remember how much it. I don't think it's a million bucks, but it was a lot. Mm. Like four or five hundred thousand dollars, and we we actually pay more money because of uh there were some issues while we were doing installations, um, scheduling issues and openings over time and stuff like that. It was temporary heat we had to provide and stuff like that. But yeah, probably four or five hundred thousand dollars we probably spent. Mm -hmm. okay. There was a state state doesn't matter whether it's state or city money, but I think it was a state funded project, wasn't it? No. Okay. Yes, that was state. That was state reimbursable. Yes. No. Okay. Mike second is that no. Let's say yeah. Let's say no. It's okay. Anyway, let's move on. All right. Let's let's, let's get moving. Let's get moving. Any further discussion on these items? Uh, seeing none, I'll call for vote. All in favor? Need more. Okay. Unanimous. Thank you. All right. We're going to move on to discussion of Norwalk High School the design development phase deliverables. It says fifteen to twenty minutes. Let's keep it at that, please. If, or if not less. Not a problem. Uh, good, good evening. Uh, my name is Paul Dominoff with Castle Boost Associates. With me today is Kate Jessup, uh, our architect and educational planner, and by phone, Brennan White. He's our landscape architect. We'll give, the intent is to give you a quick update of where we are in the process, and we have a slide deck to show you. If you don't mind, I'd like to share my screen. Sure, go ahead. Uh, let me know, Tom, if, when you can see this, please. We can see it. Beautiful. Okay. Uh, this first slide is just a reminder of who your, your uh, project team is. Of course, CSG, uh, Pro Owner's Project Manager. We are Castle Booth Architects, and the Construction Manager is, uh, again, Gil Bain. This slide quickly gives an overview of where we are with the schedule. Um, right now, if you can see my cursor, we just completed design development and delivered documents to Gil Bain for uh, uh, pricing purposes and they should have some preliminary numbers of our design development package in the middle of this month. And we've also set up a meeting with the state of Connecticut uh, towards the end of the month, I believe on the 25th for our design development review uh, uh, meeting. Uh, from there, we will enter directly into construction documents uh, towards uh, end of July. From there, uh, directly into the bidding uh, piece, which will take us to about November and then construction will, will start and span you know, just over three years after the new building is constructed. 
the existing high school will be demolished. And lastly, there'll be a piece to do uh, some of the site where the existing building currently stands. Um, I, I know you've all seen this before, but I'm gonna give a quick overview. This is where we are with design development, um, an overview of the site. To orient everybody, here's County Street and the intersection of Strawberry Hill Ave. Currently the high school is positioned right in the middle of the site. Uh, our design puts the new building, new high school and P-TECH on the existing turf field. And the turf field would be uh, displaced towards the intersection of County and, and Strawberry. In the middle is the, the, the parking. A bus loop would come around the backside and it is two drop-offs, a student drop-off and this little notch right here and a parent drop-off along the front of the building. And as far as the fields, we have the uh, softball field moved here, a multi-purpose field, track and field, uh, and some the tennis courts are moved, so all six of them. These are tiered because the site drops approximately 30 feet from this point all the way down in the intersection. And lastly, we have a concessions building uh, serving the um, athletic fields on this side and a proposed field house on this side and our grandstand in the middle. So the grandstand actually takes advantage of the slope from this high point down to the low point on the hill. So um, that's the overview of, of the site. I'm gonna uh, ask Kate Jessup, our educational planner, uh, to talk through the site plans really quick by each level. Overall, there's a four story uh, academic wing for the Norwalk High School here and a three story academic wing for PTEC here. Kate's been working diligently with the, um, with the uh, leadership and the school staff to figure out um, um, this big puzzle and to make sure all the needs are met. So Kate, do you wanna walk through the floor plan, please? Sure, Paul, if you wouldn't mind just um, using the cursor uh, as I walk through. So the area at the sort of top portion in the dark orange, um, those are your two main offices for both schools. So that's where most of the administration is gonna be located. As you move sort of down the page, um, that sort of light or orange color is the culinary program and the restaurant, which will have a secure area, which will be for the public to come into, but um, so that they cannot during school hours enter into the rest of the building, which was an important security feature. The larger area in the center is sort of the, the um, center part of the starfish, as we've always described it, is the student common. So that's where um, activities will occur as well as the cafeteria where students will be eating. To the right of that in the dark brown, that's our kitchen. And the gray area is the cu culinary and custodial areas of the, of <clears throat> the support spaces for the building. As you move further down into the site, the light blue area is all your athletics and PE spaces. Um, just north of the gym, that's a large open area. That's where the sort of cardio equipment, the weight room will be, which will open out into that, um, that area on the exterior, which is a nice relationship, especially on summer days. Um, the locker rooms on the left-hand side, as well as a bunch of the offices and support spaces. Just south of that in the dark blue, that's the pool. It has its own separate locker rooms so that um, after hours or on weekends, the pool actually can be isolated so that um, folks can use it without having access to the rest of the school, another security feature. Um, to the right of that in the light um, purple is the music spaces, your large band room for the very successful band program, as well as orchestral and chorus spaces in the, um, the sort of uh, the violet color above that, that is um, the large auditorium with the, the balcony on the second level, as well as the support spaces backstage and the, the box just south of the main theater, that's sort of a rehearsal area dance studio. As you move vertically onto the second floor, uh, <clears throat> at the top of this page, directly above the main offices, we have, that's our media center. We sort of, the, the fancy word now for what um, the library space is. To the left of that on the page is where the uh, DCAM space is. That's uh, part of the digital media program um, that exists in the school now. Um, as Paul indicated on the left-hand side, that is the P-TECH wing of the building. So those are all the, the academic and um, teacher planning areas, um, you know, the, the support spaces for the P-TECH program on the right-hand side. The same is true of the Norwalk High program. Um, where you can see that the open area in the middle is actually looking down to the cafeteria below. So it's a nice large volume space, which is really exciting. As you move um, sort of through the building further, you have um, the second level of the gym uh, you're looking down onto. That's 
To the right of that is the balcony level of the theater. Um, and then the others are larger volume spaces, which are all two stories. On the second level, you do have an auxiliary gym, um, which will serve to support um, the other programs. And just north of that is your uh, JROTC program, which is also gonna have access into that um, <clears throat> auxiliary gym for their marching program. We jump up to the third level. Again, the, the PTEC on the left, uh, Norwalk High on the right. They come together in the violet colors or all of the visual arts. So um, your, your painting, your sculpture areas, your ceramics, et cetera. Um, that's sort of the main area connected. The other spaces that you see south of that are actually the volumes coming up from the level below. And on the fourth floor, as Paul had mentioned, the, Pete, um, the Norwalk High Wing, I'm sorry, is actually um, a four stories. Um, <clears throat> One of the things that I think uh, is important that you'll see in this image right here is these two story volumes of the project rooms on the end are meant to uh, facilitate um, interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary and project based learning, something that we um, talk to with the uh, the leadership of the school, which is a, a sort of a newer space that will allow uh, different types of engineering and STEM activities to occur within the school. Um, so with that, I'll toss it back to Paul to talk a little bit about the materials on the exterior of the building. Sure. Thank you, Kate. Sure. So uh, uh, quickly, we have a few slides of images. Uh, this represents the uh, the approach that you'd see with four-story Norwalk High School over here, three-story P-Tech wing in the entry uh, in the middle with the media center above. The materials that we're proposing are a pretty simple pallet of, of brick masonry at the base, some metal panel um, above, and then uh, some uh, curtain wall glazing and a combination of that all the way out uh, throughout the whole building. Here's another wider view uh, looking as if you're coming up uh, from the field, which would be behind you uh, from the bleachers uh, walking towards the main entrance. And you can see the parking lot is bisected by this, this um, kind of pedestrian walk. But you can see the volume on the left, four stories, Norwalk High, three stories, P-Tech on the right. This is the student drop-off I mentioned where the buses would circulate around the rear of the building and then the students be safely dropped off into this uh, notch that we created, funneling them directly into that common space in the middle of that starfish diagram that, that Kate described earlier. And lastly, this is the, the, the back of the building and you can see the um, pool area on the, on the left and some of the performance spaces on, on the right. So this is uh, King Street would be behind you and we plan to, to buffer uh, between King Street and, and this, this elevation. So uh, Dan, if you're on, uh, Dan may touch on this slide a little bit about some of the outreach we've done with the, the community and, and the stakeholders for the building. Dan? Okay. Yep. Thank you, Paul. I'll jump in here. So as we met and continue to coordinate with the staff and administration, we uh, saw a trend with common questions coming up over and over again. So trying to provide that information and make it available to everyone, we went through, took the common topics and uh, provided responses to those items. And I won't go into deep detail on any of these uh, this evening, but I'll just run through the, the different areas and what we provided in this document. So. The first is building energy code, CT high performance building and green building. So uh, everyone asked what we're doing to provide a green building. The building will be built to the CT high performance building standards, which is uh, commonly known as a lead silver equivalent. And also we have our ongoing conversations with solar uh, power generation on the roof. General classrooms. There's the question that has come up over and over again about the number of classrooms and uh, between general classrooms, science classrooms, and other spaces within the school. So here we outline the number of classrooms in the school, as well as the utilization factor that the project is being designed to. Science classroom labs, there's been more interest in what's going into them, uh, the size and quantity, and how that compares to the existing building. So we have provided a response specific to the science classroom labs. Media center, uh, an explanation of what's in that media center, what can be expected, as well as the Digital Media Communication Academy, 
which originally was not intended to be part of this project, but through that coordination effort, we were able to carve out space and incorporate that in the job. Athletics and marching band. As you know, the new building will be located on the test of field complex. So in doing so, we need to provide alternate locations for athletics. And in this response, we've, um, as we've explained in previous meetings to approve that option B, how we will shuffle the sports, maintain those different athletics throughout the duration of construction and provide as little disruption as, prop as possible. And um, in here, we confirm that the marching bands program is not affected. Safety and security. Uh, we talk about the standards that the school is being designed to, as well as our coordination with the Norwalk Fire and Police Departments, school security, and the feedback we've received from them throughout the process. Technology, an explanation of what we're uh, going to include in the school and how our future ready programming will provide maximum flexibility uh, for future options. Community providers, something that's important to the Norwalk High School is uh, providing space for outside providers to come in and support the community. So that's our kind of snapshot of the commonly asked questions and our responses that have been provided to the staff and administration. Thank you, Dan. Um, just a few more slides. Uh, we uh, looked at um, solar opportunities as part of the, the green and, and um, uh, building that Dan talked about earlier. And we did some diagrams and analysis of what, what it would look like if we put uh, solar on the roof. And this uh, piece at the very bottom kind of sums it up nicely. Um, there's the energy usage of the, of the building. Uh, this photovoltaic output would handle this and it would represent about 33% of the usage of the building if we put panels in this configuration on the roof. Let me go through uh, a couple more scenarios then we looked at uh, carport uh, panels as well, two versions. This is the first version where we could put a lot, as many as we could into the, the uh, solar canopies in the, in the parking area. So uh, again, the building usage, the roof would, would uh, account for this much. Adding the carport system would add another 31%. So if we did a roof, and the this configuration of the car, uh, solar carport, it's about 64, which is pretty high, 64% uh, of the total usage of the building. Uh, lastly, we did one more scenario with less panels. And, and the logic behind that is, um, you know, there's got to be, in our opinion, a balance of, of, a, of what it looks like versus how much energy saving. So this was a study on what it would be if we didn't do all the panels right up to the face of the building because there is a visual impact with these, no doubt. Um, and again, this analysis says, um, what if we take the, the building, the roof and a smaller carport arrangement and it's just over half of the, the, the building. So um, th those are a couple of different scenar scenarios we've studied. Um, and I'm not sure if the next slide shows just some examples of the types of carports that we would uh, look at. It's, it's, there's, it's, it's a bit utilitarian from the underside. So we are, as architects, cautious. And, um, you know, we, wanted, we want to study what that impact would be visually, not block the building. And um, so here are just some examples of, of what they might look like. And I know Alan has some thoughts on this. If you want to Al in. Alan, before Alan goes, because I've been kind of a broken record on this. Um, I really do think we need to maximize the solar panels. I think I, I, I respect and appreciate your comments about the visuals, but I, I think the visuals don't pay the electric bills. <laughs> Understood. <laughs> um, and I think we do have to be cognizant of that. Noted. So with Barbara, that, go ahead. Yep. Yeah, I, just to add to that, I, I have seen some carport solar panels that are really quite attractive. Uh, you know, kind of groovy looking. So, and I, I don't know that they would be more expensive, but um, they're not all unattractive. Yeah, um, David. 
unless, unless you, somebody else, Barbara. Thanks, Chair. No, uh, just the question I had was, what is that? What is the impact um, budgetarily on the um, on the project if you do the carports? Um, am I on? Yeah. Um, we are not using capital funds to do this. We're doing that power purchase agreement. So basically, we are leasing it. So at the, the payment for, for the putting in the, the system, we need to get a financial performer from Vergy, who is our debt, uh, um, uh, preferred solar vendor that we designate recently. Um, they have to look at, the first thing, three things that they look at, the first thing they look at is that, we, I mean, as you can see, some of the very standard kind of uh, uh, solar uh, copper system, they are, generally speaking, not very attractive. It looks like underside of a, 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 a parking deck, a middle of the parking deck. So like, like Barbara says, uh, they are structured out there. They're very uniquely different kind of thing. Um, we, there are not that many of them out there that can, that can fit this span. And also the orientation is kind of interesting. So anyway, we are looking at those and especially those, those specialty ones are probably more expensive. And you can see these, these, these uh, canopies go both to a, a double load the parking spaces. So they span much wider than some of these other ones. So if any of you seen some systems out there that look great, uh, let uh, forward those uh, links to us and then uh, we'll, we'll research it further. Um, but typically when we do it, when people do a, such a large system, um, those specialty ones are not, Fitted for those uh, again. So, but oh. I think I think in law by the time we install this, it's probably a five six, five six years from now. So things will continue to change. So there's something that we need to continue to look at. Um, but it is complicated in the sense Alan, that dirt, for the power power purchase, Alan, on the power purchase agreement, in do they do the carport all the other construction as well? I know that they do on a rooftop. They do the you know the stands and the construction of putting the the panels on the rooftop. But in a carport situation, do they build all of that substructure that's there as well? Yeah, it's it's um it's something we need to coordinate. The reason being is that we we will have we will we will put the cost, all the foundation and conduit and all of that cost as part of the depreciation or, or, or performer for the for the the, the carport system. However, installation of footings and conduit underground will be done by our contractor because we're oh. going to put, we can't wait for one the other, right? So we have to put these in ahead of uh, the solar guy to come in to do this. So there's a, there's a construction phasing relationship that we have to work out scheduling that we have to work out. So we have to pre-purchase it under the site contract to buy all the uh, uh, footings and stuff like that. And then installed by our contractor, but the cost of it had to assign to the solar guy. So, okay, okay so it's, okay. Uh, it's not simple. Um, it needs a lot of coordination. And we even talk, start talking about temporary lighting because the, park, the parking lot, it comes, when we build a new building, we still got to demolish the the um, uh, the old building. After the new building is built, we got to demolish the old building. At the same time, when you do this, um, when we're building the parking lot, the solar guy needs to be there. But then you got to talk about site lighting. And and also, we have to put under lighting uh, beneath these things to provide lighting for the park. Again, it's a, there's a lot more com complex conversation need to have in terms of coordination and construction. But ultimately, we're not paying capital costs for it. We pay for it based on the electricity generated by these panels. And uh, I think it's like, generally speaking, about five cents a kilowatt, but but for a copper system, maybe more. So at some point in the future, once we determine what's a reasonable looking structural system, then we got to assign costs to it. And then uh, Vergy will, will start developing a, a financial performer to uh, to see what how it costs, what the payback period is going to be. Okay, uh, Greg. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, uh, one of the slides showed where the bus drop-off area would be. I'm curious as to where would the the car drop-off point be? Would that be the front of the building? Yes. Yes. Let me uh, reshare my screen. Uh, right now, it's just the, the way the school is set up is only one entrance on County Street. The proposed plan has two entrances. One on Strawberry Hill, and one on County Street. So, uh, Paul, you can take it from here. Yeah, 
so the the buses would come around the backside and drop off students here. Parents would come in off of uh, either county or Strawberry and and drop at the front of the building. So that um, they would have we'd have two entrances: student drop off here. I'm oh, sorry, parent drop off here and student here by bus, and they all converge kind of in the middle at the heart of the building, which works out nicely on this site. Got it. Got it. Thank you. My my follow up question is: I see six tennis courts, but I don't see any pickleball courts. Is that <laughs> not on the table? <laughs> <laughs> At this point, we don't have any for this project. Um, one of, I, I'm not sure this is true. I'm purely speculating. When a competitive tennis may not want to see the uh, pickle pot line, pickleball court lines. So we, we I need to verify. Otherwise, we will put it in. It's not a big deal. But uh, it's, uh, I think, for high school competitive sports, I'm not sure they want to see multiple lines. So we'll see. It is popular, though, these days. You it are, it uh, is growing. And by the time this project is done, it might <laughs> it might overtake tennis in popularity. So yeah, but, just food for thought, maybe one of these one of these tennis courts should be striped as a pickleball court. Yeah, it's the fastest yeah, growing sport in America. It is. It's crazy. Okay. Uh, and as you can see, the site, all the sites pretty much taken up. I mean, there's really not too much ground left. But one thing we want to know is that we also are going to uh, uh, build, uh, we build the existing field between Law High School and Aramic School. Uh, right now, it's a configuration is really awkward. The uh, it's kind of a softball. The uh, Law uh, High School so, uh, JV girls softball team plays practice there, but at the same time, it's the right, the right field is only like hundred and. Um, 640 feet or something like that kind of thing. So by we were reorientating it, we can put like 180, 190 feet uh, outfield. So uh, that's one thing we're doing. Other than that, we're really not in, encroaching onto a uh, narrow mix school at all. Okay, thank you. Um, Brian. Oh, you're muted, Brian. You keep that slide there. I it's just my eyesight. Um, from the King Street center line, what what is that measurement to the building? So, uh, oh, King Street here, King Street. Yeah, I see some. I see some like dimensions. I, I just can't oh, read geez. them. It's... Yeah, I'm not sure if I can get that. Uh, let, me, let me zoom in. And then, how how tall is the pool building? <laughs> So this is roughly around two, two, two story to two and a half story high. We kept the four story building inside the property. The three, three and four story is the uh, classroom wings, which is in the middle of the property. We purposely clipped them. The, 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 the pool wings only one, one, it's one story, but it's one high story for the pool, right? I mean, the pool is probably like 20 feet high. So yeah. we try to keep that on that King Street so that minimize the impact on the neighborhood. So we, we put it back, I think, I think that's about 80 feet, if I'm not mistaken. Don't pull me on that. Yeah, 80 so feet. But that looks like to the to the um, edge to of the, the bus line. Yeah, so what I think the, uh, the dash the dashed yellow line is the 80 foot front yard setback line here, um, which is the oh. requirement there. So you okay. can see that dashed yellow line, and the building is about 12 to 20 feet beyond that line. Well, actually, okay. the parking space 19 feet. So that's at least 20 feet more beyond that. Well, yeah, this is yeah. very helpful. I think what might be more helpful if you had a Southern profile of this, I, I think you showed us yep. the Northern. No, we did. We did, we show did King show Street it. profile. The I'll show you. Profile yep. that's in front, like looking from the softball field, that should show you the change in height, right? From the front to the back of the building. Uh, I'm saying uh, the softball field side. If, you, if you're standing on that old sand lot that's at Naramac right now, yeah. like the great out one Alan was talking about here somewhere on yeah, the side, looking straight at it from there. Yeah, that would show have, you four stories on the left, gradually lowering to the pool, right? So this is this is the only image we have tonight to show you, but you can see uh, you can see there's the drive lane, there's a retaining wall here. So that uh, field that Alan was referencing is elevated um, that, higher. Yeah, it's about 10 feet higher. Yeah. Thank that, you, Brad. So, 
we're, we're at the very end of that. That's where the, the pool is. Yeah. Go to the next image. It might be easier to sort of see the. Yeah, yeah, yeah the next image. That's what this I was looking at. King Street side. So you can see the pool area is um, the requirements for pools is about 20 feet to the underside of the structure. So you, it's a little bit taller than 20 feet at that edge. Um, that's the gray box. So you can see also the band area has some minimum requirements for the height of that space. So um, there are, that area is a little bit taller, but you can see that you know the chorus room in the, the middle there in the brick is just a traditional two-story height. Um, you can see that from this view from King Street, you can't even get the perception of the four-story um, at all. You know, you, you can't see what's that three or four stories. So your perception as a pedestrian walking on King Street will really just be that two story volume about 100 feet back. You muted. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Um, then I guess my last question just for Alan, because these this slide deck was not part of the packet. Is this going to be made available publicly? Yes, all of this, as soon as we show this publicly, it becomes available to the public. We okay, are going thanks. for a special appropriation. No, I'm, not, I'm sorry, not special. We're going for a special permit of planning zoning uh, mm -hmm. middle of this in about two weeks or so uh, to request a special permit for this project. So all of this information is available. It's been available <clears throat> in a different format. Um, um, so again, as, as you show, show these drawings at tonight's meeting, it is a public information so people can access it. And uh, Paul, I, I know I was going that much long of an all high school, we still have to go for South North School. But at the same time, can you just show the site plan a little bit? Yes. Uh, one more time for me, please. You bet. <clears throat> since you brought, uh, uh, um, <clears throat> uh, Brian, since you brought about King Street, there'd been a long conversation uh, some time ago with King Street neighbors about their concern from King Street in terms of elevation. They did not want a uh, entrance or exit on King Street which we would prefer all along, but we respect their, 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 their requests and there's no entrance or exit, even not even an emergency. We, I always thought that emergency egress was a good thing for the property, but they didn't want to see that either. So there's no nothing coming out from King Street. Uh, so we, we are, we are holding, holding true to what they asked for and we are committed to do so. Again, there's no, and then we added more landscaping along, uh, along the, the, the street side, right, right along the, so to screen it even further. Okay, well, this is all very important. And, you know, I don't mean to suck up all the air in the room, but I'm going to tell you, seven years ago, when the PTO put that stupid electronic billboard out on the corner of Strawberry Hill and County, there were at least 100 people showed up to the Board of Education meeting complaining about how that was going to destroy the entire neighborhood. So we're getting a little bigger here. So uh, thanks for covering your bases. <laughs> All right, let's keep moving. Let's keep moving. Uh, Heidi. Thank you. I just had a quick question. Previously, they were talking about an outdoor classroom, and I'm sorry, my voice is just going. Um, I just was wondering if that was still part of the design or not at all. Kate? Oh, you're muted, Kate. Yeah, sorry about that. I, I too am having some sneezing issues, just getting over a cold. So I put my camera off so you didn't watch that. Um, <clears throat> we have talked about and, and located some areas for outdoor educational reasons. We haven't gone into the full design of them. There's sort of two st streams of thought of like a true formal outdoor classroom and then outdoor educational space being two different things. One being a little more natural and flexible, one being a place with um, essentially outside desks. We do not have that sort of true outdoor classroom space. Um, we have and typically design these spaces to have full Wi-Fi in these sort of outdoor court areas. We've even talked about that, um, the bus drop area of having potential to have some fencing and have some outdoor tables for, um, which could be used for classes, but also for um, cafeteria space on the outdoors. So although, um, we haven't fully designed that component in. We have had discussions with the school. I think given what was learned during COVID about people enjoying being outside, um, having that flexibility of eating outside, there was some desire by a lot of the teachers to have that focus. So if not 
formal educational space. There will be informal areas that I think we will work into the project. Um, as Paul mentioned, we have sort of the next round of budgeting coming back next month. And I think there'll be a little bit of adjustment, obviously, in every project where we sort of make sure we're on the right track from a uh, fiscally responsible standpoint. Um, but this is one of those things that I think are important um, as an educational planner for me, I think utilizing as much of this base of the field as possible. Um, <clears throat> you can also see between the restaurant area and the Norwalk High, there is sort of an outdoor space capture that that's really intended to be area for the culinary restaurant to spill out. But there's other opportunities, I think, um, of utilizing some of that type of space as well. So um, I think some of that is contingent on the budget. And it's a sad thing, but we are we do have to sort of you know, make sure we're being responsible there. Um, but we have identified sort of areas at the end of the P-TECH wing is another example. Um, there is some area which could be utilized outside. Um, if, if Paul, you can just flash the plans and we're sort of still working with the science teachers to have the appropriate designation, but basically um, you can see those two science rooms on the end. They're actually all three gonna be at the end now. So it would be a great opportunity on the first level to have an outdoor classroom outside that science area. So I think we just have to, once we go through this pricing exercise, um, understand what those are gonna be or how much a capital budget goes into those because it's also something that is very easily uh, achieved through grants and other other financial means. So um, I'm personally very much in favor of having outdoor space utilized as, as sort of uh, student space. It's just a question of how it fits in. And um, I'm hoping once you see us again in a couple of months, we'll have something more to show you on that front. No, that was great. Thank you. OK, um, if there's nothing off, nothing uh, nothing else. Let's um, let's move on to South Norwalk. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank for you. The, uh, high school Thank team. you, guys. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you for the time. Take care. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, Alan. All right. It's the uh, now. It's the Eddie and and uh, and, uh, and Paul show. I think Paul, right? <laughs> Jeff, yeah, I'm sorry. Jeff show. <laughs> okay. Go ahead, guys. All right. Good evening, uh, Eddie Wadowski. Associate and Senior Project Manager with Tecton Architects. With me tonight is Jeff Wazinski, Principal in Charge. Oh. I believe masquerading as my alter alias uh, is Antonia oh. Ciavarella. She uh, signed in. Yeah, she's here. Yeah. I don't know. I, I'm on here twice. Not sure exactly why. But... All right. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so we are a little bit earlier in the process than the project you just saw. We're getting towards the latter part of schematic design. Eddie, been... we, we see your Outlook screen. Oh, geez, really? Try it again. How's that? No, not yet. There we go. Yep. There we go. All right. So maybe a little bit behind. Can you see my cursor okay? Is that moving? Yep. No. Okay, great. Thank you. So um, as I said, uh, getting towards the latter part of schematic design, we've had weekly uh, meetings, detailed programming meetings uh, with um, basically administrative staff and then school staff um, from the district, from both district and school. And um, we are working towards getting a pricing package out to Newfield Construction, who is our CM for the end of this week. So I'm uh, going to take you through kind of where we are right now. We've had one uh, meeting also with the community at large uh, where they had an opportunity to come and see um, what we are proposing. Really the major driver for this project in terms of where we're locating the building is the topography. Uh, so to orient everyone, we've got Main Street on the east side of the site. North is up here uh, in this image and in all the images you'll see tonight. And then we have a Meadow Street extension on the south end of the site. And as you can see from south to north is a change in grade of about 70 feet. Uh, and as you can see, it really gets aggressive on the north after the site. So that's really, um, as I'll show you on the next slide, has been kind of what's driven where we've placed the building. We've, we've really not studied as many different options for the building signing as we might normally do just because of this. 
as you can see, you know, that we really, there's a low point here. We know that there's a very uh, busy intersection at South Main Street and Meadow Street here. Uh, there is a little bit of a floodplain that comes over the, the very southeast corner of the site. So we wanted to stay away from that. Again, with the aggressive topography at the north, uh, we wanted to stay away from that as well. So really, we thought that uh, kind of staying in the center of the site really gave us the most advantageous locations to be able to connect potentially to Knapp Street uh, in the middle of the site on the west. And with the possibility, and we'll talk about this probably a little bit later, but uh, you know, perhaps uh, an easement to get across the adjacent rail spur property uh, to make a pedestrian connection yeah. up Main Street. So what we're looking at doing is essentially, you know, as you can see, kind of hitting, we're looking at trying to take down this portion of the knoll that's in the center of the site and create kind of a flatter area that we can really use for building in all of the adjacent site areas and explore the possibilities of, you know, creating some field areas up on the upper level that we can use the building for um, providing the vertical circulation required to get up to those higher elevations. We have an entrance um, at the south part of the site. The good part is, is that this driveway is not in the floodplain, so we don't have to worry about that being blocked off if there ever was uh, an emergency condition. But the major drop off for parents to come around in a great big loop here, a large parking area, and then to have a secondary loop that would come from Oxford Street and then back out to Knapp that would be used for buses as well as, and I'll show you uh, a little bit more on future slides about uh, a separate drop off for the younger students. So as you can see, you know, the idea of having these two separate loops, we've got the possibility of having a mountable curb here to be able to bring traffic from one to the other if ever needed for emergency purposes, uh, and then providing, as I'll explain to you as I show you on the plans, uh, some really great community space that's immediately adjacent to um, this lower area. We've also been meeting with uh, traffic mobilization and parking and some of the pieces that have come out with them. Um, this one, the first of all, came from the Board of Ed. Essentially, this really is a truly a neighborhood school. The population coming to this is all within the radius uh, where they're not eligible for busing. So everyone really, if with the exception of anyone who needs it for special needs, most people will not be coming by bus. Um, we're estimating that uh, the Board of Ed is estimating that more than 50% of the students will be walkers and then the rest will be by family. There is a large population that uses both before school and after school care that are going to reduce the number of volumes that will happen at peak times. Uh, we talked with them again about the potential access from South Main Street. There are currently buses that traverse Oxford and Knapp, so there's no issues there with turning radiuses or busyness of those streets. Uh, TMP is looking at a kind of an overall cohesive plan to help provide better sidewalk access throughout the city. Um, you know, we talked about, you know, the potential of, you know, if it's possible to get, you know, that rail spur property and if there's the possibility of you know, potentially acquiring some of these other properties along Oxford in particular, this one might be really advantageous to help, you know, kind of softening up um, the route, the vehicular route and uh, the turning radiuses there. Uh, they've also talked about the, the need to potentially realign uh, Meadow Street and South Meadow, South Main and Meadow Street extension, but that's kind of past our purview. We do have a traffic study that's uh, commencing and that's going to be going on throughout the month of January, so we'll be able to evaluate some of these strategies a little further. So, as I mentioned, what we're trying to do is essentially create an entrance here at the, the lowest uh, level. It's a three-story building. Having students being dropped off here, and as you'll see um, on the plans, basically being able to really get right into the cafeteria and the gymnasium. Um, we think it's going to be a really great way, uh, again, with the before care and the after care, uh, 
being in those assembly areas is really going to uh, make for a good staging of things. Students coming in, being able to get to breakfast uh, right away. Uh, but I'll, I'll explain that as we get a little further into things. But essentially, the site would kind of start to slope up this way to where there would be entrance here and here on the main level, uh, as opposed to the lower level. And what we're looking at here is, since there's really not going to be very much traffic coming from buses, we'd like to have this as a secondary drop-off for the younger students. We've got our pre-K and K classrooms oriented here, so to have a dedicated entrance where there's younger students who need a little more time to get in and out of cars, uh, can you know, their parents can take that extra time and, and they can walk directly to their classrooms. And then outdoor play areas that you see you know, all the way around the building, easy access for uh, times of recess close to entrances. And then when the building is not being used for drop off and dismissal, this makes a really nice visitor lot uh, that can be used that would bring you instead to this entrance. And you'll see that a little more on the, uh, clearly on the plans as uh, we zoom in. So this is the lowest level as I mentioned. So the idea would be the students would come in and out through here. Cafeteria and the gym could be used as really great staging areas to be able to, you know, have the kids and, uh, you know, with the walk talkies, be able to say, hey, Johnny, mom is here to send Johnny out. Um, but really to get some, this southern exposure, get some great natural light coming into the cafeteria. And as you can see, we're showing an operable partition uh, between the cafeteria and the gym. The idea being so that if you have, you know, the stage is, is placed at this side of the gymnasium, but if you have a larger event, you've got the ability to open it up and really take advantage of a great space that provides a lot of flexibility for a lot of different events. We have band and music here. Uh, as I mentioned, the grade will kind of start to slope up, but we'll still be able to get high windows to bring natural light into those classrooms. We have the loading dock comes off this way. So nice access to the kitchen servery to serve the cafeteria as well as receiving for the rest of the building. And then you can see uh, kind of utility rooms sprinkled throughout. There's a monumental stair that brings you up to the main level. And I'll show you some images of what that might look like uh, in some future slides. Here we are up at the main level. So this would be the entrance for the younger students, again, to bring you to the pre-K and kindergarten. And then nice visitor entrance here. Uh, having good visual administration of both parking lots, both drop-offs. Um, and so, you know, being able to come, great uh, ability to uh, make sure that visitors are being admitted to the building in a safe fashion. And then we have the nurse up here so that if they are coming to pick up a sick student, you can come right in and out real easily. But having this whole admin bar here really we think works out very nicely. Um, a two-story media center immediately off of the gym and a secondary, a multi-purpose space that's really intended to be kind of gross motor, another sort of auxiliary gym. Uh, for the younger students, but can function in a number of different fashions. Uh, we have a multifunction lab maker space off of the media center. Uh, and then, you know, some really, we think some really exciting possibilities for design corridor here that goes across the upper portion of the gym and the cafeteria and being able to look down into the space below. You also see the first grade classrooms here on the right side of the plan. As we move upstairs, you can see the majority of the program here is classrooms, it's second, third, fourth, and fifth. We have essentially four classrooms per grade, but we have a couple of extra ones to be able to take care of potential bubble years. Uh, you see special education, restrooms, teacher support, really kind of sprinkled throughout. We hear it all the time about the gift of time, not making students have to travel all the way or faculty travel all the way from one end of the building to the other, to be able to use these spaces, to have them really you know, scattered throughout and close to the classrooms. Again, this uh, the idea of a uh, corridor and being able to look down into the two-story multi-purpose space and being able to look down here into the media center. And what we think is a really nice piece here is the creation of an outdoor learning space 
um, essentially, you know, for all intents and purposes, this area. Um, but to be able to have some enclosed area open to the sky, but safe and enclosed, protected, and to be able to bring students immediately outside and, and get some, some fresh air and be able to take advantage of the balance between uh, natural world and the, and the classroom environment. So with that, I want to show you, this is a, a section kind of through the building. This is taken through, you see the two-story cafeteria space and the gym here with that pedestrian bridge going across. Again, really great natural light that should filter all the way through into the gym. You see the stage here. This is the outdoor learning space up at the quote unquote roof level. You see it flanked by classrooms on either side. And it's the topography kind of raises up, um, you know, from this is south on this side and north on the right. Uh, so you see the, the two story classrooms over here. And then just to kind of give you some visuals, um, you know, we showed a monumental stair in the corridor, bringing you up from the lower level to the main level and another inside the media center. And we think these are really fantastic spaces. So they're not just vertical circulation, but also the ability for, you know, seating area to be used as an, another teaching environment, classroom area, breakout space for students to sit and work on a project together or teachers to uh, teach in a non-traditional way. And then last, this uh, roof area, we think would be a really elegant way um, to be able to introduce, again, a classroom space, planting areas, natural discovery, um, really we think could be a, a very elegant uh, design element to include in the project. So uh, that is the presentation. I am happy to take any questions you might have. Questions? As, as, we, as, we, as we move forward, there's two more meetings that we intend to set up as we move forward to uh, with the uh, sub community groups uh, to get the input on the project. Uh, we are moving along. Uh, we are looking to, in terms of schedule-wise, we're looking to uh, go through all the various design phases with the anticipation that we'll go out to bid in the winter time and uh, get uh, soon the bids coming right. We'll start construction probably was like March or next year, I think it is. Uh, yes. Somewhere around there, as soon as the, as the winter breaks, but we also potentially looking at early packages to uh, to start some site work earlier if, uh, if that's feasible. But anyway, uh, generally speaking, we are on schedule and um, and um, it's um, it's uh, going to be this is going to be one of the biggest elementary schools in the system. I mean, typical elementary school is probably around 400, 350 to 450. This school is going to be 680 students. So that's one of the reasons why we have a multi-purpose room in there to support the gym may not be sufficient. So that's why we added the multi-purpose room for the gross motor skill for the younger kids. So um, again, there's no specific approval required there's, uh, as part of our process, but I want to bring this to the committee so that everybody can see what we're doing. Um, and there's a few advisory committees that set up for this. And uh, we met, I think twice now. So, um, and we'll continue to uh, work together. All right, David. Thanks, Tom. Um, Alan, March 24, start construction. What, what's our anticipated uh, uh, building open? 20, uh, 24, 20. September 25, right? 25. Oh, sorry, September 25. September 25. Okay, thanks. Barbara. Um, yeah, thanks. I, I'm curious about the outdoor learning space. Um, which is terrific. It, it looks amazing, and I'm sure there are. This is well thought out, but you know, um, help me out here because I don't understand how it would work. Um, is the snow removal and drainage uh, for rain if it's in the middle of the building like that? Yeah, one of the systems that we've used before um, very successfully is, and the nice part about it is this is right above the gymnasium. So it's a it's a own structural base. So we can treat that a little bit differently. What we would do is actually drop the roof structure a little bit, you know, a, a foot or two. And so the, the roof itself would be at a lower elevation. And then essentially there are pedestals that sit on top of it. And there are, you know, the, the pedestal system is great because there's a number of different uh, components that can be swapped out. You can have pavers, you can have benches, you can have 
planting beds, but essentially it's, it's, you know, for all intents and purposes, it looks like a deck when you walk out. So you walk directly out at the same floor level as the rest of the adjacent floor, but the roof itself is below it. So rain and snow comes down to that lower level and the drainage is, is down at that point. Well, well, let me, it's a nice maybe, system let me, because it kind of protects me, the roof a little bit. Let me interrupt you. Bob, are you right? I mean, that's a concern that I have too. Snow and, and rain is, is a problem. I think there's a, we have to balance that between the, the benefit of a secure, we always talk about you know, edu, uh, outdoor education learning space, right? The need for it. But at the same time, this is an opportunity to provide a secure area for that purpose. So I think we have to balance that between potential maintenance concerns about uh, you know snow buildup against the, the 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 walls and stuff like that versus uh, and and also I mean drainage we can manage snow it's 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 a little bit of a problem because we want to make sure that it doesn't build up and that leaks into the building and stuff like that so we probably end up with higher flashing around the perimeter of the wall so to prevent that to happening but i think that the balance really is it's a secure open open space for outdoor learning space it's it's a uh, it's very interesting we don't i mean we have we kind of don't have it but we i think it's um i'm not pushing it for one way or the other i mean it's a space available but it, having the securable it's a it's a it's a very very good idea so yeah, it, I, it's terrific. It, it looks beautiful. I think it would be um, terrific for the kids. The, but uh, yeah, I, I'm imagining like literally, you know, shoveling snow over the side because um, that's the bigger. I think drainage, like you said, Alan, is is that's a that's one thing. But the snow seems like it could really be. Yeah. A so I think what we have probably end up was probably like you know we put pavement. I mean, I'm just thinking out loud since you brought it up because I did. That was I mean you can ask Eddie. I mean this is one of the concerns I have actually. Uh, okay. But we can put more the pave pave area so that you you could go out to if you have to you can go out and shovel that snow away from the building a little bit, let it melt in the middle of the place kind of thing. But if you you know so I think there is there are I think there's there need to be some conscious man uh, design manage designed to be able to for better operating management of the facility. Thank you, Alan. Of course, of course the reality is we're getting less and less snow these days, but yeah. this is true. <laughs> we are. Yeah, you're gonna think it's about not it. Like we're right. in the Midwest. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Brian. You... Uh thanks. Um yeah, I was kind of surprised looking at this. Um what's what's was the decision for not having any entrance from South Main. I, I just would have guessed we would have accessed that property from South Main and not having to navigate there's, through the scrapyard. This fun, fun, fundamental, there's two reasons. One is that the grade changes, uh, when you South Main is lower than, when the upper portion of the site, the South Main is lower, a lot lower than, than uh, the upper portion. So we can't really drive across there. It's really up the middle portion to the lower portion we're gonna cut across. But we don't own that property. It used to be a railroad spare line. So um, ideally, we want to bring an access through. But at the same time, it, I'm not sure um, vehicle access. Uh, the other thing too, coming coming in from from Meadow Street Extension provides the opportunity to provide stacking waiting area for for uh, drop up and pick up. But if you come in, if you come in from uh, uh, South Main Street. You don't have the available space to to for for stacking, for waiting, right? So, but I think the pedestrian access is important because uh, kids coming from South South, uh, South Main Street and coming down for the northern northern part of uh, South Norwalk walking down, uh, we really don't want them to walk all the way down to the intersection and go back up again. So that's why I think uh, having a pedestrian access in the middle of the site from South Main Street which is very desirable. <coughs> Okay, what what's with the? It was mentioned, but it's out of scope. Uh, like reconfiguring that whole South Main Meadow Wilson interchange there, because yeah. where I mean, like right, you go down there every morning. There's there's garbage trucks packed up till noon, all day long down there. Like, how, 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 what's changing about that, if anything? I think there's a lot, of, a lot of cons conversation need to have to to how whether what needs how we how and what needs to be improved in terms of a uh, uh, traffic circulation at that whole intersection. I think if, as far as this project, I'm preparing that 
we can potentially put a traffic light there if that helps, right? Uh, but but there's a lot of, I mean, we, we start looking at it and I think there's uh, there are very di many, di many different opinions how and possibly, and then one of the conversations that came up was potential the changing the configuration of that intersection. Um, I'm not sure that's a solution, but at the same time, I think that's why it came up as a conversation piece. But I think there's a lot more conversation to have and evaluation need to be had. Because when you're looking at the, there's not that many cars that go onto Metal Street extension. So basically, it's coming from South Main and Metal Street and straight to Wilson, is it Wilson Avenue? Right? So, and also, you know what? I, I think this long conversation, so I don't want to get take too much time tonight, but I think, uh, we are looking at it with traffic. Tra that's on the table. That's enough. Uh, yeah, it's it's very, on, very the much on the table. And also improving, changing the alignment of the intersection. We don't own those property. We own that the corner property because it's part of railroad track. There's a retaining wall right there now. So it's get complicated, but we're, we're changing it. Does it help any? Because the flow is really from north and south. So having South Main Street come out earlier and then you stop and make a, because people coming at South Main Street, does, coming down onto South Main Street does, does not make a left turn because they go and continue to go south, right? So you don't have any really left turn movement. So we are looking right, at- Right, you're gonna go down tracks. Wood, if you're going to Meadow Street, you're going down Woodward. Right, 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 right. Yeah. So, so again, I, I think I think there's a lot, lot more evaluation and understanding of how, how the, the, the really works at the intersection. So. I can't I can't answer all those questions. And I think first thing we do is the traffic counts to see how many people make left turns or right turns and what's the peak hours and stuff. And then now we got overlay the 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 student uh, the the parent drop off period is how 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 it impact the intersection and what we can and cannot do. So there's many conversations to have. Thanks. Okay. Anything else on this? Okay. Thank you guys very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so um, the next item is going to be uh, going into an executive session to, to assess the potential property acquisition and real estate negotiations related to the South Norwalk School. So if I can have a motion to do that, uh, Mr. Burnett, all in favor of an executive session? All right, hey, Mike, we're going to be able to get into that, right? I know you. we're having a little bit of a problem with... Uh, uh, we're okay. I think, I, think, I think we worked it out. There's a separate, everybody have the separate uh, email with the new Yeah, link. but the, the, this meeting, we were, something happened with um, the feed or whatever. I'm not sure. Mike, can you explain? The, the, the Zoom app crashed on my second laptop, so I'm on a phone right now, and the third device is hosting the executive session. So if everyone moves over there, I'll promote someone to the host and then restart this meeting. Okay. okay. All right, everybody sign off of this. Well, not everybody, but all of us. Well, that was quick. Yeah. <laughs> so who's doing this thing? Who's missing? Uh, Tom, Tom Livingston. Tom and Heidi. Tom and I Heidi. think we're losing Heidi. She texted me that she's not feeling, she's got laryngitis. She's not feeling well, so we're losing okay. her. So I think, uh, if, I think Mike, I think uh, we anticipate that Jim would be joining up as executive session and uh, Jim, Jim, Jim's here and then Dan. And Mike, you can get off, you don't mind? Yeah, I just need to promote Tom to the host and then I'll be off in a second. Okay. okay. And then after that, we go back on to the original uh, Zoom meeting. Okay, Tom, you're the host now. I am going to leave the meeting. All right, thank you.
Alan, you're muted. If you're talking, Mr. Back, can we just can we just note that uh, uh, Councilwoman uh, Heidi Altman was uh, has left the meeting? Yeah, I'll do. It. Okay, we can do that in a sec. She left before executive session. So. Right. One, two, three. We just need Brian. Here's Brian. Okay, so when we're all back, yeah. So we are now back from executive session. During executive session, no actions were taken, no votes were taken. Uh, I also note that Ms. Alterman left the meeting prior to the executive session. So with that, uh, unless there's anything else, Alan, I'll ask for a motion to adjourn. Anybody? Uh, Mr. Hulvenen, thank you. All in favor? Okay, the meeting is now adjourned. Thank you.